Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar this morning. You're all very welcome and um, thank you for joining us. I know it's probably a really nice day outside so we're really thankful that you've decided to come and speak with myself and also our alumni from Queen's University who is Sinead O'Sullivan. We're here with Sinead. Uh, she has previously worked with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and she is now a senior research fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Sinead, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're tuning in all from America, so we really appreciate that. <laughs> Time difference hasn't been a, an issue or anything for you. You're, you're here, live, ready to go. So we're really thankful for that. So obviously, Sinead, you are a graduate of Queen's, and we want to talk to you about that journey. But before that, um, I think it would be remiss not to talk about SpaceX and the <laughs> Saturday. Um, can you kind of describe for people the significance of that event? Because for some people, they might not be fully aware. Yeah, it's um, it's really difficult to describe how important uh, that launch was. So for the, I guess for the for the space sector in general, why it's important is that that launch was able to show that private companies are able to um, both do the the technological uh, meet the technological challenges of of doing something as extraordinary as you know launching human uh, rated aircraft, but also proving out the business models so that you know NASA can start to um, send out some of their contracts to private companies, which then allows NASA to focus on you know more important stuff like the Mars mission or or the Moon mission. Um, so it was a, an extraordinary event, and I think the significance for people working in the space sector was really that now we have, again, established in the US, a human spaceflight program, which for many years was kind of put on hold. So really, really exciting. Yeah, definitely. And it must have been, I mean, for somebody like you who's dedicated their life to space exploration, it must have been really exciting last Saturday. Did you tune in yourself? Yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't usually watch TV, but I watched probably 40 hours of TV last week. <laughs> um, because the mission was supposed to launch on Wednesday, That's it was right, scrubbed yeah. with 17 minutes to go. So, like, <laughs> the adrenaline was pumping, the fuel had been loaded, and then it was aborted. Um, so then I tuned in again on Saturday, obviously, successful launch. And, yeah, I, I mean, it's amazing. You know, as you'll see when I go through my presentation, basically, you know, my friends and family are now everyone in the space industry. And I don't think there was a dry eye uh, yeah. when when the rocket really passed max q which is the big test i think you know there were a lot of really really happy people brilliant and i guess this question is more for my own knowledge but the collaboration with nasa and spacex that's obviously owned by elon musk it's kind of hard for me to get my head around is it a dynamic that's sort of sustainable in terms of space exploration or is it kind of going to be a bit of a fad? I mean, you don't have a crystal ball, but I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my research actually focused on the commercialization aspect of this. Uh, so how likely is this to be sustainable? It really depends on whether or not SpaceX can show that the business is profitable. So a lot, you know, the reason that, that the government does a lot of the space exploration stuff is, is because it's not profitable. Um, the benefit is, of course, to, to humankind i mean for every dollar that nasa spends there's roughly eight dollars that we get back through the economy um the sustainability of spacex really depends on whether or not they can make a profit as a business from from doing these types of launches they've kind of shown that that's possible um and yeah i, I think long term we're going to start to see more private private companies taking over some of these jobs of the government excellent so the dream of commercial space travel is closer. And again, like I'm gonna allow my mind to wander here, but <laughs> like is does this mean there's a possibility, let's say 2040, I can go to Mars on my holidays? Is is that <laughs> the only we could go on? Um I mean it depends what kind of a holiday you want. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're looking for a, a 20 year holiday um with probably too much radiation <laughs> Sure, sure. That's okay. that's a, that's a possibility. I'll maybe stick to Grand Canaria then. That's, that's <laughs> it. Um, okay, Sinead, thank you, thank you for that. You have kindly agreed to give sort of a short presentation about 
your work so far, just to give people a flavour of who you are and what you've done. And then after that, we can chat a wee bit more specifically about Queen's and how they helped you on your journey. Sure, yeah. So I'm going to get started with this presentation. Um, this is me in front of Queen's. I'm sure most people uh, at this stage may recognise um, this building. So I graduated in 2011 from aerospace engineering. Uh, so that's the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Um, so how did I get to where I am today? It started when I was 16 and I got to go to NASA's space camp, which was just, I mean, <laughs> an out of this world experience, nearly, literally. Um, so in this presentation, just super quickly, I'll just outline some of the cool projects I worked on. Um, another, something else I just want to point out is that a lot of people ask me, why did you decide to do this over that? Um, how did you get to where you are? The guiding principles I used to kind of make a lot of the decisions I've made in my career um, were twofold. I always ask myself, will I learn a lot from making this decision or, or doing this project? And super importantly, will I have a ton of fun doing it? Um, I don't like doing things that aren't fun. <laughs> so um, yeah, learning and fun. And it's always in the context of exploration and adventure and friends and family, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so yes, I did go to Queen's. It was incredible. And I worked really hard. Aerospace engineering is not really easy, um, but the faculty and the professors there helped to make it less difficult. Um, you'll see here some of my friends. This is one of the coolest projects. I, you know, one of my fondest projects, let's say, um, that I've worked on was designing this autonomous drone that was going to carry a ton of golf balls and do a ton of cool stuff. And I worked relentlessly on this um, at Queen's with my cohort in my class. And it was a ton of fun. We got to build loads of stuff. Um, we got to test it. We flew it. We won, which <laughs> we didn't let anybody forget. Um, and in the top right, you see me on my graduation day. And those are my those were my best friends um, within aerospace engineering. And to this day, they're still you know, my, my absolute best friends. Um, so yeah, we, we all worked really hard, um, but it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, obviously everyone who goes to university is probably more wondering about the playing hard, um, which we absolutely did do all of these pictures. So, you know, I think if we go back here, you can see that I was in the, the rowing club as well as, as, um, doing aerospace engineering. And those two things probably took off most of my time. Um, and so, you know, here I'm camping with my rowing um, team, uh, doing a, a 24 hour cycle, uh, which was pretty fun. And yeah, socially, my class, we were really close. There were only 25, roughly 25 of us, and we did everything together. So these are probably <laughs> the more um, PC pictures <laughs> I could find of us on nights out. But we had our end of, end of, um, end of year galas, we had our, our group gatherings. You see Professor Price there, uh, used to come out with us from time to time. He was the head of aerospace engineering, our group Christmas dinners. So it was a ton of fun. Um, so after Queens, I actually went to International Space University, which is absolutely as ridiculous as it sounds. It was space camp for adults. So I was sponsored um, by, you'll see here, I was sponsored by the UK Space Agency. Uh, here I am at the uh, European Parliament building representing the UK. Queen's University were really pivotal in making this happen for me. I basically went to Professor Price after I graduated and said, look, I really wanna do this thing. I'm sponsored by the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency, but I'm short um, a certain amount of funding. And they wrote a check and sent me on my way. And it, like it, this experience changed my life. and. Queens being a part of that was really meaningful. Um, here I am doing my first robotics competition, which was a ton of fun and, and doing satellite orbit and control maneuvers. It, it was insane. Um, I did several projects at the European Astronaut Center focusing on human performance in space. This is the European Space Agency's kind of astronaut training um, program. And you see mock-ups of the International Space Station here. This is my group. Um, I in particular looked at isolationism, so I, I, I focused on long-term isolation missions, which are akin to uh, the Mars. The Mars mission would be a prime example of something that's like 
really long duration that you're kind of stuck in a capsule with six people and it's probably how a lot of people <laughs> today are feeling in isolation. Um, so I did a lot of studying on this with the astronauts at uh, the European Space Agency. Um, did some really cool uh, human slash asteroid uh, uh, robotic mission design for the Jet Propulsion Lab and that was focused on asteroid mining. Um, so that was really unique um, so my expertise is human spaceflight design. This was unique in that it had a really big um, robotic component of it. So this is probably the only mission where it's that like kind of uh, joint uh, human uh, robotic missions. And as you can see here, I am with Mars um, Curiosity rover, which was amazing. I was actually in uh, mission control in Houston when when that landed on Mars, which was in another incredible space moment. This you can see, so that this project was looking at um, basically, <laughs> sounds like science fiction, an asteroid doing a, a pretty close flyby of Earth. This uh, contraption would um, basically swallow, and this is not a size, this asteroid was five kilometers long, um, would swallow the asteroid, basically put it in a big bag and there would be thrusters on the bag that would bring it into what we call lunar retrograde orbit, which is basically uh, an orbit around the moon where it would stay. And then we would send humans to the asteroid uh, orbiting the moon to do some exploration um, stuff, which was really, really cool. Um, this was actually the Curiosity mission control. I got to spend some time there speaking to the Curiosity rover, which was also super fun. Um, yeah, and then exploration robotics. I did a ton of stuff uh, on exploration robotics, and that was really interesting because exploration robotics is so multidisciplinary. You have to be able to do 10 million things and think about things in a really, really um, diverse way. So here you can, on the top left, you can see that the, I, I did some underwater, sub to underwater robotics for the US Navy. Uh, this was one of the happier days um, when I moved to the US when they sent us this absolutely, this is a very small component of it, this multi-million dollar robot that we got to play with. Um, and we actually sent it to Hawaii to do a lot of um, testing there. So we made that into a fully autonomous robot that did a lot of weird and cool stuff. Um, here we are at the lake testing some of the electronics. The thing about testing, I was doing this in Atlanta, uh, on the lake is that it is the most humid place I've ever lived. Um, so not only did I get really burnt as an Irish person doing a lot of lake testing, but um, for any of the girls out there, it was not good. It was not a good look for your hair. Um, here I am with some of the special forces. Um, they, you know, we did a lot of work for the, the US Navy and military. And so they, they um, thanked us for that. Here I am uh, probably several hundred feet underground, um, doing a lot of caving. Um, we used to do a lot of human exploration to figure out how to encode that into, um, into the robots. So whether it was like being at the bottom of a diving pool or being at the bottom of a cave or swimming through caves, um, we got to do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, here I am, one of the other type of autonomous robotics that you have are rockets. So here I am with, I don't know if you recognize the guy in the middle, um, pull like a dog. <laughs> I managed to rope Gary O'Donovan, the rower, into um, coming to this rocket launch with me, which was super fun. Um, so he's now a big rocket fan. And on the bottom left, randomly at a conference for robotics, I met, I, some of you may, if you do aerospace engineering, recognize these people in a few years time. That is Daniel, Professor Daniel Sobin and, um, and Professor um, Butterworth. And um, yeah, I got to hang out with them, which was really fun. Uh, so it's funny to see your, your professors when you're younger um, become your colleagues as you get older. Um, yeah, mission control. So because I did a lot of human space flight, um, I spent a lot of time at mission control. So the Johnson Space Center is not only where you have uh, Flickr, the flight control room and mission control for the International Space uh, Station, but it's where they do all of the human space flight testing and astronaut, astro, astronaut training. So here you'll see me, uh, we did a lot of cool stuff with uh, 
Robonaut, who is actually now on the space station. So, so he is doing um, a lot of autonomous experiments on the space station. So he was launched in 2014, I think. Um, here I am with one of the many astronauts um, that I've since become friends with, that's Mike Fink. Um, this is a mock-up of the space shuttle that is now decommissioned. And it's just, interestingly, if anyone watched the launch over um, over the weekend, you'll see that none of the, it's hard to see in this picture, there are buttons everywhere. And so a lot of the, the human um, training for this is, for you know, you, if you're if you think about being a, uh, an astronaut, you're under like maybe four G, so you, it's a lot of pressure in your body, and you're trying to like find one button out of five hundred thousand. Um, if anything goes wrong, really difficult. So space actually, SpaceX actually completely redesigned the cockpit, which is cool. Um, so yeah, Mission Control, amazing place. It's also I did I didn't have any good pictures to put in. It's where they have basically a mock-up of the space station um, underwater. So that astronauts uh, can do practice their spacewalks because the the water kind of acts like a zero gravity environment, um, and so we spent a lot of time there as well. So for every fun fact, for every one hour of uh, a spacewalk that an astronaut astronaut will do, they've spent eighty hours in the pool practicing. Um, so that's a lot. They they do a lot of time in the diving pool. Um, yeah, so then I also went back to the European Space Agency and did a lot of climate change modeling um, with the European Space Agency. So the European Space Agency does a lot of the satellite based stuff. Um, they do a little bit of human exploration, but mostly it's satellite based. And so I was working with Copernicus, which is their, their huge um, satellite um, constellation, to look at different ways to take the data and commercialize it and actually use it to look at things such as um, climate change modeling, um, resource depletion in certain areas like sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then as you can see here, some of my friends, like the space industry is, is really small. And um, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I went to the European Space Agency and ended up <laughs> meeting um, Ryu, who, who I was with in Strasbourg. And, she was in Hawaii and he was somewhere else. So it's like a really fun uh, group of people that you keep coming into contact with, contact with. And yeah, just, those are just some examples of the projects I've worked on. The other really cool thing about um, this industry and working in this space is that everyone always wants to hear about it. And so you get to speak a lot and educate people a lot in what you're doing. Um, this is when I spoke at the International Astronautical uh, Congress with Elon Musk, so that was amazing. Um, I actually, just before I spoke with Elon Musk, I had uh, lunch with uh, a really famous astronaut. Um, you get to do weird things like go on TV and get asked questions about <laughs> artificial intelligence and extraterrestrial uh, life. I did a TED talk um, in Belfast. Um, I did a lot of work with the, the New Zealand government. They've now launched, uh, they've now created launch capability. Um, and uh, this is me with uh, the former deputy of NASA, chief of NASA, um, Charlie Bolden. I was given an award by him, so that was really fun to meet him. Um, okay, so getting towards the end of, um, of the presentation, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. So when I think about what projects I want to work on and what I want to do, I think about whether it's going to be fun and whether I'll learn, but it's always in the context of exploration and adventure and friends and family. And for me personally, one of the things that I love to do uh, is explore and have adventures. I do a lot of avalanche skiing, hiking, camping, um, I do a lot of now uh, offshore regattas. This was in the middle of a 36 hour <laughs> crossing of, of Lake Michigan race. Um, here I am surfing the North Atlantic with um, actually my friends from aerospace over Christmas. And here I am in New Zealand doing a three day camping trek. So like I love exploring, but it's not only um, exploring the physical world. I love adventures when it comes to learning things, meeting new people, uh, culture, and society and so one of the things that I always think about doing is uh, or think about when when I look at projects is is this going to help me explore or be more adventurous um, 
and then friends and family. Uh, you'll see here, uh, my mom has been to every graduation of mine, just trekked halfway across the world several times. Here's my stepdad. We love to do things like cycling together, uh, a good friend and I sailing together and hiking together and my, my family over Christmas with our dog. And so one of the things that's really important for me is to really think about my friends and family when I make decisions, like where I want to work, what projects I want to work on. And um, yeah, just thinking about how I can incorporate that aspect into your life so that you're not always working. You're, you know, you also have some, some uh, family and friends time. So that's the end of my presentation. Amazing, Sinead, thank you so much for sharing that. It's an unbelievable journey you've been on from growing up in Armagh to going to Queen to then traveling the world and doing what you love. A few things that stuck out there from asteroid mining to working with multi-million dollar robots to going on nights out with Professor Price. It really is a <laughs> range of things that you've had there. So it is brilliant. But mm -hmm. what I want to do now is take you back to when you were thinking about actually applying to Queen's. Mm -hmm. Was aerospace engineering something you always had an interest in? I know it was probably the NASA space camp helped you make that decision, but prior to that, were you interested in space as well? Yeah, yeah, I kind of was. So, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who don't really know what they want to do. And so for me, I was always really lucky in that I felt that, like I always wanted to do that. Um, or at least I wanted to do something that was technical um, and something that, again, in, involved some sort of exploration, adventure, learning, fun. For me, that was aerospace engineering because when I went to NASA, I saw that the engineers have a ton of fun and I'm not just making that up. It's really awesome. And so I thought, like, why do anything else? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I was considering different things. Um, astrophysics was one of them. Um, briefly, I considered doing uh, law, which actually I, I then decided not to do, um, obviously. But yeah, I kind of always wanted to do something technical. And uh, yeah, aerospace engineering seemed obvious for my interests. Yeah, but it's maybe, you know, your approach there was finding out the kind of things you enjoyed as opposed to the big picture of the course that you wanted to study. And you yeah. figured so, so that was really good. Um, I know this is a question that probably comes up a lot, but I know Queen's does some really good work in helping with like gender disparity in courses like uh, aerospace engineering. Is that something you find, well, in Queen's yourself and in other universities? Yeah, so... Um, Queen, so when I went to Queen's, um, so just as a caveat, it's something that exists, but it's not something that I opt, like it, it would never have put me off. Um, yeah. But I do understand that for a lot of people, it's really, it, it is quite um, uh, intimidating. And so at Queen's, I was actually really surprised. Like I was at Queen's several years ago now, but um, out of the 25 people in my class, we had seven females which is a which was a lot and it never felt like because we were so close it just never felt like there was a difference um I never you know when I was doing my A levels I was the only girl in my uh undergrad in my physics class and then you know there were a lot more girls in the um in the aerospace class but I now know that you know I'm obviously still really involved with Queens and with the aerospace program and I mean, not only have they managed to massively increase the number of people who want to do aerospace engineering, which is amazing because now we have all these great engineers, but starting with Mark Price and now with Brian Falson, who's the head of aerospace, they have made such a clear and openly communicated commitment to making that 50-50. They've actually achieved that, which I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, so any of the other universities I've worked at, the numbers are just so wildly off in terms of, I mean, when I was working at, um, at a lab at Georgia Tech, there were 200 people in my lab and there were three females. That's, that's less than 2%. Yeah. Um, and so Queens have done an amazing job at really putting, and it's not just for undergrad, providing support for um, PhD students who are females, people who want to move from PhD into professorship, who are starting to have families. Um, so yeah, I think Queens actually sticks out in terms of what I've seen across the board for creating that kind of balance. Amazing, that's really good to hear. Mm. Um, so you made the decision to come to Queen's, you got on campus. 
find that actual teaching, you know, was the quality what you expected? Did you learn lots of new things? What, what was the teaching like when you actually got to Queen's? Um, so at the time I had nothing to compare it to apart from my A-levels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the teaching was great. I mean, I was never in a situation where I didn't know what I was doing or I was confused. I mean, like aerospace engineering is not easy. You know, yeah. you know like rocket science, is not the easiest course you can do, but it is not the it is not it is not the hardest thing in the world you can do either. I was in a class with thirty people, and we all had strengths and weaknesses. But it was really there was a lot of camaraderie. No one was left behind. The professors made sure that everyone was with you was with them along the journey. And so, at no stage did I ever feel overwhelmed or that I couldn't do it or that it was too much. Uh, no, I like it was you know. The, the teaching support was amazing. That's good. And it was, um, it, sorry, the other thing I need to add is that it was yeah. just so much fun. <laughs> like we had a great cohort. Um, we, you know, we were all, by the end of the first week, I think we were all just best friends. And so more so than other classes, aerospace engineering had, um, or that other degrees, aerospace engineering was pretty much nine to five. And it was just like being back at school, but you're adults. Like you go in, you have the crack, you learn something. It was really good. It was great. Yeah. Brilliant. I guess you're you're coming into a course with like-minded people, so you're all automatically going to click and connect. So that that's really good that you had a good experience there. Um, I understand you didn't maybe get as much opportunity to travel while you were at Queens. You certainly made up for it since you've traveled <laughs> class. But while at Queens, do you regret maybe not doing a bit of travel, or have you have you incorporated that now into you, uh, what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I travel a lot now um, globally. But when I was at Queens, I was really focused on well, I, I was doing um, my course, which was nine to five, but I was also in the rowing team, and that was actually a really big part of my life there. So when I wasn't in class, I was training. And I would have traveled a bit with rowing to different regattas. Um, weekends were certainly spent training. We did training camps. Um, but yeah, that was a really big part of my life when I was at Queen's as well. Um, so I didn't travel as much when I was with Queen's. You know, I, I have a lot of friends who, who did the, the, the placement year. Um, so they went, actually, a couple of friends who did the, um, uh, the year at another university in Europe. <clears throat> I can't remember what that was called. Okay. Erasmus, um, probably, the Erasmus, yeah. And you yeah. know, weirdly, a week ago, I was walking through Harvard Yard and I bumped into one of my friends from Queens who did the, and I, you know, he graduated a year later than me because he, he had gone to Stockholm, I think. And I bumped into him in Harvard Yard and he's living in uh, in Boston now. But yeah, we were talking about Queens and the, he did the Erasmus and he really enjoyed it. So I guess I didn't, there was, there are a lot of travel opportunities. Um, I didn't really, um, make the most of them because I decided that I wanted to do rowing instead. And so you, like, you don't have an infinite amount of time. You have to kind of pick and choose. But um, I will say just quickly on that, like when I was applying for universities, I applied mostly in the UK and um, in England. And um, I really wanted that kind of international experience. You know, I kind of thought that I never saw myself going to Queens in Belfast. You know, I kind of wanted to go a bit further, meet new people. And when I, because I really wanted to do aerospace, um, I ended up in Queens and, and I had what felt like a very international experience, even though it was locally. Um, I ended up living with people who were, you know, who were from overseas. Uh, the people in my course I had never really met before a lot of my friends were not from the UK. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like I did even get a little bit of an international experience. Well, it sounds crazy being at Queens in Belfast, yeah. 40 minutes up the road from Arma. Um, I, know, I mean, Queens, you know, for those two in Queens is such a diverse campus that you are meeting people from over 85 different countries around the world. So you do get that feel of different cultures and uh, through just being on campus. So. Um, it, I definitely understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Right there about the clubs and societies. It's great that you're able to find the time to do that as well. Um, but kind of if we if we move past Queens, then after you graduated, was there any influential people that helped you on your journey? And 
was it a difficult decision to to move to America and how did you navigate through that? Um, so I actually relied quite, a, not relied, but I used Queens a lot when I left. I knew that I wanted to do something in space. I knew roughly what I wanted to do, but I really needed uh, some help getting there in terms, not only in terms of like recommendation letters and you know, trying to bribe professors to say that you're an amazing student. <laughs> but um, yeah, really relying on the network of, of the professors as well. So as I said, when I, you know, after I graduated, I stayed in contact with um, my professors who I, I really liked. Like they were really amazing. And um, after I left, there were a couple of things that I wanted to do. Like I said, I literally emailed Mark Price, set up a meeting with him, went to see him. I was like, look, I really want to go to the space university. Um, I'm short this much of, of, uh, of uh, a scholarship. And I, like, I'm not going to get it, basically. And he wrote a check. Like, he didn't think twice about it. And that, for me, really cemented my relationship with Queen's, that he was willing to take a massive leap of faith on me. And I... Yeah, that was that was absolutely life changing for me. And even you know now, now I set up um, a way for Queen's students in aerospace to kind of go into that program. Um, the other thing I guess was that when I decided I was moving to the U.S., I knew I wanted to work at NASA and to do other stuff. There's a professor called uh, Danny Sobin who was in one of the pictures that you saw, who basically helped. She's an American professor and had worked at a lot of American universities, and she was absolutely pivotal in make, in helping me make that transition to the US. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do it without her. And then, you know, to bump into her at a conference in the US was just amazing. And, you know, when I'm back at home, I always go to visit them. Um, I actually had some some really interesting design work that I, that I got some of the masters and PhD students at Queens to work on for us doing satellite design stuff. So like, yeah, I, I really use the, that connection with Queens all the time, even today. Yeah. yeah, it's so good to build up those networks and those relationships. And it's great that you've been able, been able to continue those after you've left uni. In this sort of environment we're in at the minute, Sinead, it's kind of a bit unsettling and it can be seen as a bit of a setback for some people. I'm sure you faced some setbacks along your journey. You know, you can highlight really there, but surely there were setbacks along the way. How did you kind of overcome those? And do you have any advice for people thinking, you know, maybe uni's not for me? Yeah. So, yeah. The other thing I meant to say when I was given that presentation is that you're going to see some of the highlights. Um, people rarely, rarely mention <clears throat> the low lights. And I can promise you for every highlight that you saw, there are probably thousands of, 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 <laughs> of lows. Um, it's not easy. It's it's really not. And people don't talk about it enough. I actually um, had applied to go to university and when I was doing my A-levels and I guess I didn't, no one in my family had really gone to university before. Um, my sister went to do medicine um, a year before me, but I didn't really understand what engineering was. And I got really kind of, yeah, I guess I got scared and cancelled my UCAS and decided to take a gap year because I just didn't, I was really worried about what if I'm not good enough or what if I don't understand it? I don't really know what it is. I mean, that's one example. I then reapplied. I, I you know, I took a gap year, got some um, engineering experience with a, with a, pharma, with a pretty big um, part of pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in the UK uh, and reapplied and felt like I had a lot more confidence to go. But I mean, even today, like, with those achievements under my belt, for every positive um, achievement you get, you have to you have to fail ten times before you get there. And I guess you just become very comfortable with the thought of not succeeding, and that's okay. It's not embarrassing. Like, I yeah, even when I was at Queens, I failed some modules. If you spoke to some of my teachers or professors along the way, they would say, oh "My God, I <laughs> working at NASA? What?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's about, I think it goes back to, do you love what you do? Because then you will work at it. You know, you don't have to be the best at it. I mean, my God, when I'm, you know, at NASA, there are some people who wake up in the morning and can solve the rocket equation in their sleep. That's not me. I'm not one of those people, but I am diligent and I do work hard and I enjoy it. So 
yeah, you, there is a lot of failure, but as long as you're okay with kind of picking up again and kind of brushing it off and saying, okay, no one's perfect. No one's going to get it the first time. Start again. Super. So yeah, it's all about the resilience. It's about finding that thing you love and finding your own personal strengths as well. So, you know, not comparing yourself to other people, but finding your own strengths. Brilliant. Listen, I'm sure people have heard enough from me and they want to ask you some questions. So I'm going to open up our chat box. So all the questions in this that any attendees put in will be private. So it'll only be myself and Sinead seeing them. So feel free to, to ask anything you want. While those questions are coming through, Sinead, um, you're a local girl from Armagh. You've traveled to the US. You've like followed your dream. It must be so satisfying and exciting to be working in space at the minute with the likes of SpaceX going on, but also it's an exciting field at the minute. Yeah, um, it's amazing. I think I made this comment um, over the weekend. The amount of people who have been watching the launch over the weekend. I mean, rocket launches have been happening for obviously decades. Um, it's amazing that normal, I say normal people, non-space people um, know about them and have an opinion on them, which is completely new. And it's really cool to see that people who typically wouldn't have um, been involved with the space process before are now starting to watch it. It's becoming a really big part of our lives. I mean, we actually rely, people don't realize this, we rely on space resources for nearly everything that we do. Every time you pick up your phone, every time you go somewhere and order an Uber or, you know, drive somewhere, use your GPS, we're using, um, we're using space capabilities. And so I think um, what's really cool is that now that they're becoming more commercial um, and people are starting to see more of it, they're aware of, of how they change our daily lives. And it was kind of mind blowing, really, really, really cool to see that like friends of mine who are not involved in the space industry are like also watching the launches and are nervous and are getting excited. Brilliant. No, it is, it is such an exciting time. And even for me, like a normal person, <laughs> exciting for me on Saturday to, to see that happen in the launch. So it is really good. So our questions are coming in thick and fast here. The mm -hmm. first couple actually are quite similar. Did you ever consider becoming an astronaut yourself? <laughs> Do you ever see yourself having the opportunity to actually go to space? Um, did I ever? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people used to laugh at me when I was um, younger and I would say things like, oh, I want to become an astronaut because that's one of those things similar to, oh, I want to become the first female president of America. It's just one of those those things that kids say that they don't actually yeah. ever think are going to happen. Um, now I didn't get anywhere nearly close, but I was able to work with a lot of astronauts and I'm lucky that I can call a lot of astronauts, my friends. And, um, why did I not? Because I guess ultimately I just had, you know, it came down to visa issues and the fact that I'm not an American citizen and I can't apply. <laughs> um, but that doesn't stop me from sharing in the success of the space program. You know, I think we saw this weekend, um, um, Bob, who, you know, who I know quite well, um, being launched to the space station, you know, that is such a small part. What you see when you see those astronauts go up, yeah, they go through a ton, like they go through eight years of training to even be able to get on board yeah. something like the space shuttle or SpaceX. But um, it is a small part. They're, they're, they were only two people in thousands of people who made that mission happen. So. Um, as much as I think it would be amazing, um, there are restrictions, but there are millions of other places within that ecosystem that I can contribute. Super. Um, the next question here, did you always want to go to Queens or had you looked at other universities? Uh, I had looked at other universities. I had applied, where, uh, uh, Imperial did aerospace. Uh, I applied to Cambridge. Uh, they did not do aerospace, but they did. I think at the end of the program, you could specialize, do a few aerospace modules. Um, Bristol, Bath, Queens, and then down south, I applied for astrophysics at Trinity. Um, as I said, I actually ended up canceling my UCAS and taking a year out and thinking more about what I wanted to do. Um, then when I decided to go to Queens, I had a, I, I just felt more confident in myself and knew what I wanted and felt like I was more able to just go there and do it. 
and kind of you know had that confidence and like I said the reason I applied to places in England was because I wanted more of that international experience and I actually was able to get that in Belfast I mean you know it's it you know when I used to see people going to Belfast they'd go home every weekend um they lived with their friends from from school and I actually wanted to do something a little bit different and I did you know I <laughs> I don't think my mom saw me until Christmas <laughs> and um I lived with international students and I made friends through rowing in my class who were from completely different places so I felt you know you could I could have been anywhere but I guess ultimately I had the convenience of being in Belfast, which is an incredible city. It's small enough. Um, it's small enough to feel like, you know, you can go everywhere pretty quickly, but it's, it's big enough to be dangerous yeah. and really yeah. have fun. Um, so yeah. This next question. So you were talking about different places you had applied to in different degrees. Uh, you had thought about this person's asking, what would you have done differently at school if you could? And what other degrees could lead to a job as an astronaut? So they're thinking big. What sort of degree would you have to go for? Uh, what would I have done differently? Nothing. I don't. I don't think I would have done anything differently. That's not to say that I, you know, at school I was amazing. You know, I did not get the grades that I wanted at AS. Um, again, going back to the fact that. You know, <laughs> not there wasn't this very clear trajectory uh, for me to be here um but i worked hard and proved them enough to 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 get to where i wanted to be um i don't think i would have changed that i mean yeah maybe getting more perfect grades i don't know but then i wouldn't have been able to play rugby and do all the other things music that i love doing um the, the other part of the question was Oh, what, what kind of, yeah, what kind of degrees? So here's the thing about the space industry. There are um, space doctors, it's like medical doctors who do a lot of research um, through the space station. There are space lawyers. One of my best friends uh, is a very well-known space lawyer, which is something that you never think about. He is constantly, you know, fighting with China's space lawyer and Russia's space lawyer about who, which orbit should which satellite be in. Um, there are spacesuit designers. So I think, you know, um, the, the, the SpaceX launch um, spacesuits were actually done by a costume designer. But typically, again, some of my good friends are very involved with spacesuit design. There are, you know, there's, I, I have a good friend who's a geologist, a really super important aspect of, of NASA is geology. So like, it keeps, for me, it goes back to do what you love do what you really find enjoyable. Um, I think for specifically for becoming an astronaut, um, you know, a technical degree. So whether it's physics, maths, engineering, your typical STEM, I guess. Um, but then do do it in what you love. Yeah. C plenty of questions coming in here. People are really interested, which is good. Um, how did you uh, manage to get into the position where you were working in the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA? Um, yeah, like everything, it was, <laughs> it was trial and error. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, a lot of, a lot of, and this is not just in the aerospace industry, a lot of um, moving up is about the net, creating the network and getting to know people. So I had done enough space, stuff at, uh, at the European Astronaut um, Center, the European Space Agency, to enable me to move over to NASA. Um, when I was at NASA, I really got stuck into human space flight. And um, just through my network, I knew that they needed somebody to project manage um, some of the human and robotic um, missions that were coming up. And so it's just about networking. Uh, working hard, proving that you're good at what you do, and then putting in an application. And then, you know, being <laughs> really happy when you get it. <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> um, couple of questions here about sponsorship. So you had mentioned that you were sponsored to go to the International Space University. And another question just about how you go about getting that sponsorship. Could you go into a wee bit more detail about that? Yeah. So I like, yeah like everything it was just networking so um 
I knew that I wanted to go. The problem was that it cost like 50,000 euros to go. Um, so there was no, I mean, like I had just graduated. I had no money. Even if I did, I mean, it's a, it's a huge amount of money and it just seemed impossible. And I was able to get 35,000 um, euros from the European Space Agency, which was huge. But then I'm down 15,000. Um, I managed to get... I think it was like, and again, it's like pestering people, emailing them. What do you want me to do? How can I get sponsorship for this? Yeah. I will do whatever. Um, I will write blogs. I will, you know, I will work for you for free for the rest of my life. And so the UK Space Agency um, gave me 10,000 euros, which was amazing. And I'm still really involved with them. And um, yeah, I had to find the last few thousand. And it was really you know, I didn't even really think about Queens and it was only a few weeks before the deadline. I was panicking and I thought, okay, I'm going to email Mark Price and just let him know that I, I have this opportunity. I've got these other amazing sponsors who are behind me. Are you, are you interested in, in getting involved and putting the Queen's name on, on this? And he immediately said yes. Um, which was really, yeah, you know, I, I felt really proud of that, like that he, took that risk in me yeah. and so um at the minute there's no formal pathway for aerospace engineers to do that but i there's there are three students in the last five years who have expressed that they wanted to do it that i've helped them navigate the european space agency the uk space agency and then the queens kind of coming together to do that um, one of them actually is lauren amazing she's now doing a phd in space stuff so at Queens, I think, yeah. So yeah, it's really cool. There's like a cluster of Queen space people, which is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is quite a good question. Of all the places you have worked and lived, where has been your favorite? Uh, uh, for me, Belfast. it's about the- Belfast. <laughs> yeah. For me, it's about the people, uh, not, not the play. Um, look, I was going back through my pictures all my photos um, to put something together for this presentation. And you know what, Belfast, like I've said it before and I'll say it again, I love Belfast. I love going to Belfast. Um, Belfast is an incredible place. You, you don't realize how much a place, how amazing a place is until you leave it. And I can tell you, there is nowhere that I've had the crack <laughs> quite like Belfast. Just that, you know, even culturally, you know, I, it's, there are so many amazing writers, um, actors, artists, obviously, you know, engineers and academics at Queen's. Every time I go to Belfast, I end up leaving with either a new piece of art from a local artist or, um, yeah, I, yeah, Belfast is an amazing place. It really is. Super. That, that answer wasn't rehearsed at all, by the way. <laughs> It really wasn't. <laughs> um, so that's quite a good question. How does the transition from going from a bachelor's degree to a master's degree, how did you find that? I found that really tough, really tough. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if my mom is listening to this or not. Um, if she is, she's probably thinking, oh my God. She had many, many late night uh, phone calls for me crying and saying, I can't do this, this is too difficult. I guess for me, I moved from Queens to the U. So I did my master's in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech in the US. Um, and whilst I was there, I was working on all of these space things as well. So I had much less time to focus on, on full-time education, which was a full-time degree. Um, and I was getting used to a completely different um, education system. So I found the transition actually really tough. Um, yeah, there were several times where I thought I'm not cut out to do this. I want to quit. Um, actually, that's when I reached out back out to um, Danielle Soban, who had uh, helped me move there. And again, the, the Queen's network was amazing, you know, providing that support and that help. But yeah, like it was not easy, but it was very worthwhile. You know, in the end, I like most things, if you stick at it and it was something I really wanted to do. So I knew that I, I didn't want to quit. Um, it kind of, yeah, I figured it out. And obviously now I'm in the US university system, I'm MIT, 
I was at Harvard Business School. So like I'm much more used to that now, but it, it was it was tough. Definitely not easy. But as long as you have the right people around you, like friends and family, um, you know, Danielle Tobin was amazing for that. So yeah. Um I'm kind of going out of sequence with the questions here, but I think this is relevant because you've just spoken about it. Someone has asked, did you ever consider completing your master's at Queen's? Yes, I was actually on the master's track. Um, and again, similar to, <laughs> similar to, um, to when I was applying to Queen's and got cold feet and didn't really know what I was doing, I had one of those moments uh, at Queen's as well and um, actually decided to go from doing the master's down to doing the bachelor's and so I graduated unfortunately with the bachelor degree and um, I knew that I wanted to do a master's um, and so I, I obviously went back um, to get one but I actually spent a year working in finance um, which is like a dirty secret I don't often tell people, um, did not enjoy working in finance. And so, uh, yeah, I, I wished I had have stayed on, but I had one of those moments where it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. Should I stay? Should I, you know, should I start, you know, should I enter the workforce? And ultimately I did leave and it probably wasn't the best um, decision I've made, but it, you know, it's a decision that I did make. Um, yeah. But, Certainly all of my friends, um, not all of them, half of them did the masters and they really enjoyed it. So yeah, I am a bit gutted that I didn't um, stay on. So that is actually a regret. Um, this one is, is quite an interesting question this. So you've had, there's a lot of, um, this person's kind of complimenting you quite a bit here, which is lovely, but they're saying you've had some <laughs> accomplishments but how do you think the pandemic will affect career opportunities in civil airspace sector? And also is the space industry sector um, for recent graduates? So for graduates, do you think it's going to affect um, opportunities? Um, yes and no. I think that specifically within space, no, I don't think it will affect the space industry because I think it's not like people are going to buy less satellites or they're going to buy less launch capabilities. We need space. So like I kind of mentioned earlier, everything we do on a daily basis, the internet, GPS, making a phone call, relies on having space capabilities. Um, again, because space exploration missions are government run, that's not going to be affected. And those budgets have been built out years in advance. Um, so I don't think like specifically within space, which is quite specific, I don't think there'll be any kind of effect there. Where I do think there may be an effect um, is not whether or not the jobs will be there, but how people will interact with those jobs. So I think, for example, that a lot of the, the work will become remote. So if you're doing programming, if you're, you know, for example, a lot of the work that I could have done at NASA, I could have done remotely. Um, some of it I could not have done, like robotics, you, you need the actual hardware there. Um, when I think about graduates now thinking about the pandemic, I think you need to start thinking about what kind of roles you can do remotely. So that's anything like computer programming, project management, um, but certainly within the very specific sector and space, those satellites still need to be built and the funding is still there. Um, I, I don't think the space industry will be affected by the pandemic. What advice, what advice would you give to a prospective aerospace engineering student? <laughs> That's quite broad. Um, Maybe a couple of we, a one, could you do a one or two liner on this one? Yeah, I think like, honestly, you know, for me at Queen's, again, it goes to the work hard, play hard. I had easily the best three years of my life there because I was in a group of people who were super inspired by what we were learning like and that's that sounds really corny but it's true like nine o'clock every morning people were like buzzing to get going and you know I was around those people and I became one of them and so it's like take the work seriously 
and do it and it's really worthwhile and you're surrounded by people who are doing the same thing so that's easy um but then also like really enjoy it like you know there are other experiences that people have at universities i mean look the engineering building is right next to the bot so that was so like work hard play hard (laughs) i don't know the number of times i finished um off homework sets or tutorials the group of us frantically trying to to do them before happy hour started at the bar (laughs) so like you know do as do as much work hard play hard as you can like just experience as much of it as you can you talked previously about setting up an opportunity through queens um for students to move to the international space university um is there anywhere where people can get more information about that yeah so like i said i mean i think definitely inquire um within the faculty at queens um that's a pretty um it's not exactly set up um in any particular way at the minute uh usually i will get an email or two every year from someone um who's been sent my direction saying hey i'm thinking about applying to isu and then i work with them directly so um i mean you, you need to have finished your or you need to have completed quite like at least I think two years of your undergrad to be applicable for that program. But um, yeah, usually if you're in the aerospace or the mechanical engineering um, department and you were to say to someone like within the faculty that you wanted to do it, uh, lo and behold, I will get your email. (laughs) I get quite a few of them every year. And so I'll work with you to figure out what you're trying to do why you're trying to do it and then figure out what funding mechanisms are available. I think Queens has typically been quite good at promoting and, and supporting those applications. Super. Have you found the Queens alumni network helpful in your journey after QUB? So you, you've spoken about that. The network is really key. Um, and particularly when it came to moving and working in the States, was the network helpful? Yeah. So I, unfortunately um only kind of became like officially involved with that alumni network um a couple of years after i moved you know to the states um but i will say in an informal capacity um moving to the states is like this is not an easy country to move to it's a really complicated thing to do and um Again, when I first moved here, I relied a lot on the advice that was given to me by Professor Soban. Um, I ended up living in New York uh, for for quite a while and just through that network met a ton of people who were from, I mean, it's everywhere. You go into a pub and you realize you're talking to someone from Belfast and they know so-and-so and and you realize, oh my God. (laughs) And I kind of developed that network informally. Um, Now I'm a part of the alumni network and um, yeah, I actually reached out to someone this morning about a project from the network. So I use it all the time. I, um, and I think I'll probably start using it increasingly more. So it's just a really good way of meeting people who have done interesting things and know interesting people and maybe can help you in what you're sure. trying to do. We're, we're coming up to an hour here, Sinead, but if, you, if you're happy to, I'd love to go through the rest of these questions because there's only about five or six left. Sure. And- how did you apply for the European Space Agency and what sorts of skills set you apart from your other competitors? Oh, God. It's like an interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm starting to sweat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, so I basically got, again, it was through the network. Um, basically, when I, was at, when I was 16 and I went to space camp, my mentor at space camp i stayed in contact with she ended up moving um to she she went to the international space like you couldn't make this up she went to the international space university herself um fell in love with a dutch man who worked for the european space agency when she was at nasa moved to the european space agency and started working there and so then when i was at the international space university she'd been a mentor of mine since i was 16 I reached out to her and um, I had been doing some human um, performance and space work. And so she organized that. Um, so it, the space community is really, really small. Um, there's about, there's a couple of thousand of us and we, we all know each other. And so um, I guess what it comes down to is having that network um, 
working consistently. So both producing good work consistently, um, being trustworthy so that they can say, yeah, I actually know her. We worked on this project together before she was good at it. Um, and then again, it's an industry where people are really, really inspiring and inspired. And so being one of those people who's really positive and fun to work with is really important because you end up working in weird places, you know, sometimes for, for long periods of time together. So it's personality fixed is also really important. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the network's so important, but yeah, it's, if you know everybody and you're not producing good work, it means nothing. So it's a, a bit of both there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, you were talking about space camp there briefly. This person has asked, how did you actually get to go to NASA space camp when you were 16? Um, I found out about it and applied. And I was actually the second person from Northern Ireland to ever go. Um, and I had to pull a few strings. <laughs> um, yeah, that wasn't super straightforward either. Um, so here's the thing, right? And it, I realize it works at, at any stage of life. You can just email or write someone a letter or pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I want to do this. And nine times out of 10, they'll be like, OK, that's a bit weird, but we can try to help you figure that out. Yeah. And um, that's kind of how I've done most of the stuff that I've done. And yeah, I mean, so now actually um, I've formalized that process. So I've created a way for one student from Northern Ireland every year to go to NASA Space Camp, fully funded. Um, actually, Queens, Mike Price, is, <laughs> Mike Price is sick of hearing from me. Um, <laughs> when I was trying to set this up, I actually called him another one of those calls. I was like, look, I really want to set this up. I want to send an A-level student from Northern Ireland to space camp um, every year. And he said, fine. And so now Queens actually pay the, the space camp fees um, as part of their sponsorship every year. So it's basically free for the student to go. And so we've been doing that now. I do it in conjunction with Southern Regional College. So um, that's now a formalized process. Um, so one student goes every year. But yeah, I mean, I guess when I wanted to do it, it was more of a, how can I <laughs> wrangle my way in? I think your phone might be ringing off the hook after this, Sinead. People are going to take your advice. <laughs> I'm you. Um, yeah, they should. Yeah. How was the transition from A-level to university? I can't remember feeling like it was difficult, so I assume it was okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there was a lot going on. Like I said, I had gone through that period of not thinking by, you know, worrying, am I going to be able to do this? Is it too hard? And then I think when I got there, I don't remember thinking that it was ever too hard. I was actually probably like at the time, I mean, it was so, so much new stuff. Um, the first year of aerospace is really consolidating what you know and getting everyone on the same page. So that was really helpful. So like, even if you were coming in feeling like your maths wasn't as good or your physics wasn't as good, by the end of the first year, everyone across mechanical, chemical, aerospace is on the same page. Um, also in the first year, we did a ton of really hands-on building, which I love, I love building things. And it was just, there was so much going on in terms of like, you've met your new friends and you're building loads of cool things and you're like, flying these planes every like I don't remember thinking it was hard but I do remember having a ton of fun so I think it was it was a, an easy transition Perfect. it was an exciting one though, that's for sure it sounds it it definitely sounds like a lot of fun you know you're out there doing things and it's very practical so that's good like we it's insane we still joke about like me and my friends from Queens I mean yeah we, we you know I think <laughs> in our first semester we were building these these playing it was a competition and um you know like we just we, we ended up super gluing everyone's bags inside out and like <laughs> it was non-stop like just really good crack and <laughs> um, did you there's a couple of questions asked there about this so we'll combine them did you have any kind of work experience before applying to queens yes because I took a year out and worked at uh, a company called, so I, I, I'm not sure if the company, um, there was an organization called Urine Industry, Y-I-N-I.org. God, I can't, I don't even know how I remember that. Um, I don't even know if that website exists anymore, but um, 
I decided to do a year with them because I wanted to understand more about what engineering was because I, again, was felt really nervous about whether or not I thought I could do it. And then when I ended up, you know, I ended up working um, as a development engineer at um, the world's second largest manufacturing, chemical manufacturing plant, and got to, again, that was another cool thing. I spent like six weeks learning, you know, getting my welding qualifications. I was doing a lot of computer CAD work. I was doing a lot of systems, um, piping, building, removing stuff from the plant. That was a really hands-on and fun um, industry um, placement. And I actually think that helped quite a lot to visualize. So some of the stuff that you'll learn in engineering is quite abstract, but I was able to kind of visualize it because I had done it a little bit before. So yeah, I, I did that one placement and I really enjoyed it. Super. Um, last question here and then we'll, we'll just finish up. Maybe a valid one, I hadn't thought of this, but could having bad eyesight limit your chances in the selection process? <laughs> As a European, how did you work with American um, NASA? Um, yes, unfortunately, you need 2020. Um, but you can correct it 2020. So if you can get, um, if you can get surgery, uh, laser done so that yeah. you're, you're corrected to 2020, but you do need 2020. Um, you don't want him to be flying the space shuttle and your, your glasses, you know, start yeah. <laughs> drifting yeah. off and, and suddenly you're in China instead of the space station. <laughs> um, um, and then the next question, oh, as a European, oh yeah, that, <laughs> that was not easy. So as a European, I did not have a clearance because you need, basically it's a, any space mission is a top secret um, defense and military operation. And so that, that was a really tricky one. I spent, I never, I, yeah, that, that was not easy. I had to get special clearance to work on the Mars mission um, because I had already worked on human factor stuff at the European Space Agency. So I got some clearance, really special clearance to do that. Um, even with that clearance, anytime, like for example, at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, because I wasn't a green card or American citizen, I didn't have my top security clearance. So every time I left the, like I basically had a chaperone with me. So anytime I went to the bathroom, the chaperone would go to the bathroom to make sure I wasn't stealing like state secrets. Um, I would have to do things like look at our code blind. So I wouldn't, they would have to take lines of code out so that if I stole anything, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to have the whole thing. So it was definitely really complicated, but I still got to work on some cool stuff and it wasn't so complicated that it, you know, but yeah, it was not easy. I know I said that was the last question, but two more have come in. So if we do them quickly and then we'll finish up. I just, people have taken the time, so I wanna yeah. go for it. So do US space programs or space agencies change with the change of US presidents? Yes, and that's a big problem when it comes to space strategy. Um, as my friend, the space lawyer <laughs> will tell you, it causes a lot of headaches. Um, what we saw with Trump so what Obama did uh, very, very cleverly, the, the space so the space strategy under Obama was amazing. He basically um, created this very long term trajectory. So the goal was to get to Mars. Um, there were stepping stones along that that would create a way that, that would create technology to get to Mars, but a way for testing it. So, for example, my asteroid mission was one of them. How do we create the robotic capability? Um, for, for doing a lot of the stuff that we want to do on Mars, but test it closer to home. So that asteroid mission was a core part of that. Um, the issue, and, and the issue is that space exploration, these are long-term things. So like building something to go to Mars could take 15, 20 years, but when you have a president that changes every four years, yeah. um, you can start to see the problem. So then I guess when Trump came into office, he decided he wanted to go to the moon, not Mars. And, in my opinion, that that's not a that's not a. I mean, there's nothing on the moon that we we can get that we haven't already done. Um, so my missions were were both cancelled, and so you have these people that have been working on, um, you know, and your missions will change. But you, if you've been working on something for ten years in Congress, 
Uh, I remember the morning I got the phone call saying that actually the mission has been axed. Congress weren't going to provide any budget for it anymore. And so you think, oh my God, like <laughs> you've spent, people have spent their lives working on something and, you know, the president has decided he wants something else. So I guess that's one of the negative, like they're one of the very few negatives that you're kind of, you know, working under a four year program. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, last question. What project did you study towards for your master's? Um, uh, well, project, um, I did a lot of them. Um, my master's, so my master's was in the US and I guess in the UK, you have like a master's thesis or a master's project. It's not really like that in the US and certainly the lab that I was working in because I was doing all of the space stuff, military stuff. Um, I did a lot of different projects. I guess I guess the one that like kind of ticked the qualification that I ended up using was um, um, UAV or drone policy work for the FAA, the Federal um, Aviation Authority. So, um, and they actually implemented them. So I basically created uh, a numerical way to create policy by looking at the, to, to, to regulate these autonomous drones in the airspace by looking at the fatality rate of civil aircraft and reverse engineering, um, the payload, the altitude that they can fly so that um, the failure rate was within the accepted civilian aircraft failure or mortality rates. So I guess I used that project, which was quite different because it was a policy, but it used a lot of engineering methods. And it's, good, it's great that that came to fruition. It wasn't cut short after four years or whatever. You know. No, that one that one is still, the, the, yeah. they haven't changed the policy yet, which is nearly worrying. <laughs> Sinead, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. Really informative, really interesting. But I think it has given the young people watching this a real insight into what obviously the space industry is like, but also what queens can offer in terms of that journey so thank you so much for that i'll give you the final words what would be the one final piece of advice that you would give to young people thinking about applying to queens um ooh, a lot of pressure there i think again i'm just going to re reiterate what i said do something that you love i mean queen like belfast for me was the ideal place to do it um do something that you love do something that you really find interesting um, and work hard at it and but enjoy enjoy the process of doing it so. Sinead once again thank you so much thank yeah, you thank you tuned in today and um, there will be more events upcoming next week so check out our web page for that but in the meantime I wish we could all give you a round of applause I'll give you one Sinead <laughs> thanks very much uh, <laughs> hopefully we will see all our attendees at Queen's very soon bye-bye everyone bye